to appreciate the prayers of the congregation for uh, the one uh, of our family who was uh, grievously unwell and in fact dying at this moment. Uh, there's nothing like uh, being at the, the bedside uh, yesterday for 11 hours of one that uh, is approaching very quickly the point of death to confront uh, your own heart and mind and soul with the reality uh, that uh, death is. And that is why we are here, isn't it? Because uh, we're not Christians because we just think it's something that makes you have a better life in this world. In fact, Paul could say that if it's only in this life that we have hope, then we are of all men uh, to be most pitied and miserable indeed. Uh, So we look to Jesus because, even as I said yesterday to my brother in the flesh, that this life is not the end. The end of this life is not the end. It is but the beginning. And as we read from Revelation 21, where it says that God will wipe away all tears and there will be no more sorrow, no more death. That is our hope. That is our blessed hope. That when we close our eyes for the last time in this world, we will open them in glory and we shall see him as he is. Blessed hope indeed. Turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. And we are going to read from verse 18 to verse 6 of chapter 4. Colossians chapter 3, uh, verse 18 to chapter 4 and verse 6. And as you're turning there, let me just outline very briefly uh, the book of Colossians. In fact, you can, you can do it really with three words. And that is chapters 1 and 2, salvation. Chapter 3, verses 1 to 17, sanctification. And then from the verse we're going to read now to verse 6 and even to the end of chapter 4, we have situation, salvation, sanctification, and situation. That's really the outline of Colossians. So let us read from verse 18 of chapter 3. Wives, submit yourselves unto your own husbands, as it is fit in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing unto the Lord. Fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men-pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Whatsoever ye do, do it heartily as to the Lord, and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of persons. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Continue in prayer and watch in the same with thanksgiving, with all praying also for us, that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ, for which I am also in bonds that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without, redeeming the time. Let your speech be always with grace, seasoned with salt, that ye may know how ye ought to answer every man. May God bless the reading of his precious and holy word. We can even talk about not just salvation, but even sanctification in abstract terms. 
And Paul's exhortations in verses 1 to 17 of putting off the old man and putting on the new man is not enough for him. He must bring it right down to our situation. Our, the old way of saying it would have been your station in life, your place in life. How is your salvation and your sanctification worked out in real terms, in a real way? You, we can speak the, the language, we can talk about these words, but when the rubber hits the road, in the situation you're in, not on a, a Lord's Day evening, but on a Monday morning or on a, a Thursday afternoon, how is your salvation then? How is your sanctification then? So the title for the message uh, this evening is Five Relationships That Test or Prove Our Faith. The children are probably familiar with uh, this science experiment that if you take a, a bottle of Coca-Cola and put uh, certain sweets, I think they're called Mentos or, or something, you put it in, there's a, there's a, a reaction between the, the Coke and the sweet. I've never tried it, I'm not saying you should, but the, the, the effect is quite dramatic. And, and the question for us uh, this evening is does our relationships with these things that we have read, does it conform or does it collide with our Christian profession? In other words, is my real life, when you're not watching me, when I'm not watching you, does my life, the normality of my life, collide with or conform to my Christian profession. So let us look at these five relationships briefly this evening. And of course, you'll say, well, I don't fit in that one, but you will fit into one of them. You will definitely fit into at least one of these relationships, but the principles can be applied to all of us, even if we are not fitting into each one. The first relationship is the marital relationship. We live in strange days. I'm not talking about the last year and a half. I'm talking about really the last 30 or 40 years, and maybe slightly more than that. We're living in a strange time when all the norms that our forebears, our grandparents, our great-grandparents that would have taken for granted are being dismantled. And this one, this marital relationship, is under extreme attack in our lifetimes. Notice here the commands, and these are commands, these are exhortations, this is not an option. What Paul says to wives and to husbands is not, well, if you feel like it. No, this is what you are to do. This is your calling. This is your station in life. This is where God has you. And therefore, if God has you there, he has you there for a purpose to do his will. So in verse 18, the situation for the woman in this situation is a wife. And she is called, and it's a very unpopular word today, and I was even conscious uh, for a preacher, the first verse to read, and he's reading this verse um, is in itself a challenge <laughs> but here it is wives submit yourselves unto your own husbands now notice here it is a willing submission it is submit yourselves there's nothing here of a type of religion and there's religions like this in the world where women are forced to submit where women are put down, where women are forbidden to uh, go for education, where women are made second-class citizens, where they have to walk behind uh, their husband by force. That's not what Paul is saying. Paul is saying his, submit yourself. 
You make the choice. As Psalm 110 says, Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Wives are here called to make their choice. To submit themselves, and notice this, unto your own husbands. Not somebody else's husband. Not some other man. But submit yourselves unto your own husbands. This is not talking about the the big difference between men and women. This is talking about the marital relationship. And then it says, as is fit or suitable or appropriate in the Lord. If you're a Christian woman, what Paul is saying, if you're a Christian woman, this is what is appropriate. If you are married, this is your calling in relation to your husband. The husband is called to love their wife and be not bitter against them. Now what you notice about these two commands in verse 18 and verse 19, and I would suggest this to you, that this is not what comes natural. In other words, the reason why Paul is commanding these things is because quite often left to ourselves, this is not what we'll do. The man will uh, not show love to his wife as he should. He will become not only selfish, he will become bitter because he uh, is putting himself first. One of the things you notice about people who don't live lives that are honoring to God, quite often what they do is they take it out on other people. We've seen that, haven't we, in our experience. Somebody lives a life that is wrong and other people become uh, the, the victims of their sin. Of course, love is not just an emotion. Love is not just a feeling. It's much more than that. It's acts of love. It is the... The, the giving, as Paul could say to the Ephesians, husbands love your wives even as Christ loved the church and gave himself. The call of the husband is to give the whole of the self to his wife. Not just to give her a present on certain times of the year, whether it's birthday or sometime in February or whatever that is. That's not what Paul is saying. It is give yourself all that you are all that God has made you, all that God has, uh, the, the position that God has put you into as a husband to your wife. Give yourself. If we could borrow the, the words uh, of Paul to Timothy, give thyself wholly, completely, to this great calling. See, we have to confess, don't we, and maybe even the generation past would have to confess this. That one of the reasons why our children, the children now, are not enamored with marriage is because they've seen so many bad examples. The challenge for us as Christian husbands and wives is to show that our faith, when it comes to our marital relationships, makes a difference. The reality of Christ can make us loving husbands and submissive wives, willingly doing those things that God has called us to. But then secondly, we have the parental relationship in verses 20 and 21. Children, obey your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing Unto the Lord, fathers, provoke not your children to anger, lest they be discouraged. And what's wonderful again about this is that that Paul includes both parts of the relationship. It is to be a reciprocal, it is to be this obedience. The fathers are not outside of uh, authority. They are under the authority of God just as much as their children are. It says to the children, obey your parents' In some things, in the things that 
you want to obey? No, in all things. Now, of course, we understand that if a parent asks a child to do that which was contrary to God's word, the child not only has the right but the responsibility not to obey. Remember an example of this where um, the child was asked to, to say, I, I'm not here, and the knock comes to the door. I'm not here. The child said, no, can't do that. That's a lie. That's against God's law. You see, we believe, don't we, and as the, the larger catechism says that the, the fifth commandment doesn't just apply to parents, it, it applies to all those who are in authority, our responsibility, and that ultimate authority is God. And therefore, if if parents ask us to go against God's law, we say no. If the church asks us to go against God's law, we say no. If the government, whoever it is. So it's assumed here in all things that what the parents require is right. And then it is well-pleasing because, as as we will see later on, we're not actually obeying the parent. Ultimately, we're obeying God. Him obeying. The responsibility of the father is not to abuse his power. Not to abuse his power. One of the arguments that we have used off the, the, the main point of the text, but one of the arguments that we've used of women regarding the abortion issue is don't abuse your power. You see, men are stronger than women uh, and they take advantage of that. Men are stronger than children. They take advantage of women are stronger than their unborn child and they take advantage of that. We're not to abuse our power. In fact, someone once said to me many years ago that uh, as a parent, we only have the, the position of power for so long and if we abuse that position eventually when it comes to the, the natural change over from power to influence we'll have no power of influence we have to be careful not to provoke not to make them angry with us not to get them to sit in the corner and thinking why is my father such an angry person why is he so mean to me Now, you might say that in the wrong sense. Because you might just be wrong in your own judgment. But fathers are responsible because we don't want them, as Paul says, we don't want them to be discouraged. We want them to grow. We want to nurture them. We want them to grow up to be godly men and women. You see, this is, again, going back to the main point of of, of this message. This is where our faith makes the difference. And this is where we can destroy um, our faith, our profession. Because this is where it matters. You see, we can know all those wonderful verses in chapters 1 and 2. We can know the great principle of sanctification. But if we're not practicing it in these relationships, we are failing at the crucial point. At the critical point where it really matters. So that's the parental relationship. But then thirdly, the workplace relationship. The workplace relationship, and that's in verses 22 to 25. And again, we have the reciprocal responsibility. Now, when the Archbishop of Canterbury uh, divided up the the chapters, uh, it was Stephen Langton, wasn't it, who divided up the chapters uh, back in around 1200 or something. Um, He got a lot of it wrong. We've we've gone through Isaiah recently, and you know the last three verses of Isaiah 52 should definitely be in chapter 53. And here we have an interesting one where he separates the servants in verses 22 and 25 from the masters in chapter 4, verse 1. (laughs) So that certainly is a a bad choice there as well. I wonder, was there some uh, reason for that? I have no idea. Someone once said that the reason is he was going along on a horse, and when he would go to put the point down, the horse would move and he'd he'd get the wrong uh, position and so on. But he got it wrong here as in other places. The servant's responsibility, there's a number of things we see here. In verse 22, the measure of the responsibility. Servants obey in all things your masters according to the flesh. You see, there might have been a temptation 
the, the Bible tells us I'm an heir of God, I'm a joint heir with Christ, I'm seated in, in heavenly places with Jesus, I'm so much above these masters in the flesh. Paul says, no, God has put you underneath these masters, as they're called here, or you might say your manager or your boss in, in this time. Just like the children obey. So your father leaves the home and he goes to his workplace. And just like you, he has to obey what his boss, what his manager says. The method of this responsibility, not with eye service. Don't just do what people see as men pleasers. But in singleness of heart, don't have a divided heart, have one heart. In the context of fearing God. And whatever you do, do it heartily. Don't just do it grudgingly. Well, well, God tells me I have to do this. You know, God tells me I have to obey my parents. God tells me I have to obey my master. God tells me I have to submit to my husband. So, grinding my teeth, I will do it. But I don't really want to do it. You know, it's like, is is it a Quaker story where the... The uh, child is told to to stand while the the singing. And he refuses to stand. And the the mother demands that he stand when when they sing. And eventually he stands up. And he looks to his mother. And he says, Mother, outside I standeth. Inside I sitteth. That's not to be the way it is with us, is it? We are to do it heartily, lovingly, joyfully, because it is to the Lord, not to men. We're obeying Him. We're loving Him. We're submitting to Him. We are honoring Him. Again, going back to the main point, this is where our faith and our profession become real. Become real. The motivation, which we've already mentioned, verse 24, knowing That of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance. The matter of fact, reality of this responsibility, for you serve the Lord Christ. The warning of this responsibility. But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done. Do you know one of the most frightening, to me, one of the most frightening phrases in all of Scripture is, God is not mocked. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that also shall he reap. That should send the fear of God into our hearts, shouldn't it? That God sees all I do. That when I'm not here on a a Lord's Day evening looking the part, and I'm, you know, in a place where nobody else can see me, God sees me. God is looking and even examining why I'm saying these things now. Weighing me up in the balance. Remember the king of Babylon, thou hast been, thou hast been weighed in the balance and are found wanting. Fearful things. Fearful things. Here's, look at the end of verse 25. There is no respect of persons. There's a temptation, isn't there, with all of us? Well, I know the Bible says all that, but, but God deals with me differently. You know, I'm, I'm special. You know, I, I'm allowed to think these thoughts, these wrong thoughts. I'm allowed to do this particular sin. You know, just God ignores that. No. No. There's no respect of persons. Don't think you're special. Don't think that you have a dispensation <laughs> for your particular sin, your, your particular disobedience. Because God's word is the only thing we know that God has to say. He, he has, in fact, as Calvin says, outside of his word, God is done. This is God. He has declared himself. The master's responsibility, verse 1. Masters, give unto your servants that which is just and equal, knowing that ye also have a master in heaven. Wonderful check to masters who think 
you know, we've all probably maybe experienced in our lives some people in a certain situation, whether you worked in a in whatever situation you've worked in, but there was this person who thought they were the, the masters of the universe, you know, and, and they took advantage of that. Here Paul says, you have a master. You'll meet him one day. Don't you treat your employees in a way that you would not want God to treat you. Do unto them as you would have God to do unto you. You know, a parable where forgiveness is not shown. The answer is that he receives the judgment of his debt. Fourthly, a relationship to prayer. <laughs> and, and this is wonderful because God's word is wonderful because at this point, maybe you're feeling, I failed. I've really failed. I've not done all that's been said thus far. What do I need? I need prayer. I need to come to the Lord. And, and the great failure um, is not necessarily uh, realizing all the, the, the areas you've failed in, but, but the real failure is not turning to this relationship as much as we should. I've, I often say to people that, you know, in, in a sense, and I have to be careful because I don't want to be antinomian, but in a sense, people do not miss out on heaven because of their sin, but because they fail to respond to the, the antidote, to the answer. You know, the prophet says, why will you die in your sins? And as Christians, why do we not go more to prayer? When we see our failings, when we see how we've, and even the failings of this week, of this day, of not honoring the Lord's day as we should, why do we not go to our knees in prayer? And that's why Paul brings in this relationship. Three things to note on this relationship to prayer. It is to be constant. Continue in prayer. There's a sense in which, as Paul says to the Thessalonians, pray without ceasing. So we're, we're praying now, aren't we? He said, no, no, I'm preaching and you're hearing. No, we're praying. We should be. When you're driving to work in your car, I'm praying. When you lie down at night, you don't have to be, it's good to be on your knees, it's a good position to, to have in prayer, but you don't have to be on your knees. It is Prayer is the attitude of the heart to God. I'm, I'm reading Thomas Manton at the moment. Manton is wonderful. Volume 1 of his works, if you have it, read Manton on the Lord's Prayer. Powerful. And he makes this relationship between what we are, what we really feel, what we really desire, what we really want. And Manton says, you must, your prayer must become part of that. Not something separate, not something disjointed from what you really want, from what you really desire. He says, your prayer is simply the, the outworking before God of your desires. As Paul could say in Romans 10, my desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. It's a constant relationship. It is, secondly, a grateful relationship. Look what it says. Watch in the same with thanksgiving. You know the Jews in the Old Testament? What was their sin? One of their sins was constantly complaining. You've brought us out of Egypt. You, you've brought us into this wilderness to die. Complaining. Moaning. Nobody likes a moaner. Nobody likes someone who's always complaining. God loves people who simply say, Lord, thank you. Thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for choosing me. Thank you that I'm not where I should be in the pit at this very moment. Thank you. I, I really emphasize this with the Lord's table with our people. There's a real sense in which the Lord's table is an expression of thanks. That's what one of the words mean. It's, it's thanksgiving. It's saying to God, thank you, Lord, for being my Savior. 
We're glorying, rejoicing in all that God has done for us. It's a grateful relationship to prayer. And thirdly, it is a gospel-focused. It is to be a gospel-focused and gospel-advancing relationship. In other words, prayer should always have the gospel as preeminent. Seek first the kingdom of God, the extension of his kingdom, as, as, as our brother prayed earlier on, that the, the, that the kingdom would be advanced, that souls would be saved. This is to be central to our prayers. That's why in verse 3 and 4 he says, with all praying also for us, pray for gospel ministers. See, maybe some of you look at the preacher or any other preacher that might and say, well, He's such a godly man. You're, well, that can be the first mistake. But the second mistake is, I don't really need to pray for him. He's so spiritual. The Apostle Paul pleaded for the prayers of God's people. Pray for gospel ministers. They are saved sinners just like you are. Dealing with their sin just like you seek to deal with your sin. They fail. They struggle. They get depressed. They are weak men who need the prayers of God's people. This is why I love Romans 1. When Paul says to the Romans in chapter 1, I, I want to come and I want to encourage your soul. This is my paraphrase. But I want to mutual, or, but then he says, I want to mutual edification or, or mutual encouragement that I can be an encouragement to you and you can be an encouragement to me. Paul wasn't up here. Paul wasn't some ivory tower theologian that walked on the clouds. You know, like some of these Eastern sort of mystic ideas of the gurus walking around and nothing touches them. No, Paul said, I need encouragement. I need to be with the people of God. I need to see the faces of God's people. I need their holy kiss, their embrace, and their love, and their prayers. He says, pray for us that God would open unto us a door of utterance to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in bond. Paul didn't trust himself to be faithful to the gospel without the prayers of God's people. Do you get that? Paul didn't say, don't worry, I'm such a great theologian. I've got it all worked out. I've got the gospel, you know, point by point. No, no, I need you to pray for me that I will remain faithful to my calling. I need you to pray for me that I will not become a castaway, a heretic. That I will not become a Joel Olstein. I will not become like one of these crazy nuts on the God channel I don't want to become like one of them I want to stick to the gospel I want to stick to the to the message of Christ you pray for me you pray for me that I will not fail that I will be constant and I will be committed to the gospel of Jesus Christ that I may make it manifest, verse 4. In other words, make it clear. As I sat beside the bed of my brother yesterday, I prayed, Lord, just help me to say the, just the simplest things. The clear, not many words, but just clear words. And, and I found I, I, I couldn't say anything until I had the confidence that I, I'd maybe a sentence to say that made sense to me, first of all, and hopefully would make sense to him. Paul prays or asks for the same prayers back in Ephesians 6. We don't have the verses in front of me, but you know them well where he's talked about the the armor of God. And again, he prays similar words in verses, or or seeks prayer in in similar in verses 18 to 20. Lastly, our relationship to the world. We've considered the marriage relationship, the parental relationship, the workplace relationship relationship, our relationship to prayer, but now finally our relationship to the world. And there's three things in verses five and six. It is to be a wise relationship. As someone once said, we live uh, in enemy territory. This world is not a friend of Christ. This world is the enemy of Christ. This system, the, the leaders of this world 
are the enemies of truth. They're like Pilate who could sneeringly say, what is truth? What are you talking about? How ridiculous. Why are you mentioning such things to me? So I was talking to some of the family yesterday and the, the name Lazarus came up. And they said, who was Lazarus? They didn't know who Lazarus was. And I said, he was a man that was four days in the grave and Christ said, come out. And they said, do you actually believe that a man could be dead four days in, in a grave and anybody could call him out? I said, yes, and they laughed. No friend of the truth. No faith. Dead in trespasses and sins. Mockers of truth. Mockers of God. Walk in wisdom toward them that are without. We need to be as wise as serpents in this world. Secondly, it is to be a useful relationship, redeeming the time. The world has a phrase, killing time. You know, the world sort of Monday to Thursday is like they can't wait to get to Friday and then they, you know, waste that time as well. And it's all about killing time. That's not what Paul says. Redeem, buy it. Just like buying the truth. Buy time, redeem it. Buy it back. See time as the most precious thing that you have. It is to be a prepared relationship finally let your speech be always with grace seasoned with salt that you may know how you ought to answer every man peter puts it this way sanctify the lord sanctify christ in your hearts may he have the special place in your heart in other words love him it's not that christ physically dwells in the pump that sends the the blood around your body. It means love Christ so much. Love the truth so much that you will be prepared to say what you need to say to sinners who are going to hell. It doesn't say we have to win every argument. In fact, it's not even talking about winning an argument. It's talking about it. And get this. Sometimes we, we judge too much by appearance. And this is why I love the presuppositional position because it's not my job to get an outward confession of, of faith from somebody, but it's my, it's my um, responsibility to be so clear and to have so much conviction about what I believe that when that person walks away, they'll think about it. You see, you don't... We, we've, we've bought into this idea that somehow we have to win the day at that moment. No, no, you just have to be so in love with the Lord that when people meet with you, that will change them. That will have an effect on them. See, these relationships to, to marriage, to parents, to our workplace prayer into the world this is the place that God has called us to so we can't just talk about salvation and sanctification in abstract terms they need to be lived out in a world that needs his salvation may God bless his word to our souls Amen let us sing from Psalm 145 Tune is Duke Street. It's the second version on page 302. O Lord, thou art my God and King, thee will I magnify and praise. I will thee bless and gladly sing unto thy holy name always. Psalm 145 and second version on page 302, verses 1 to 6. Let us stand to sing.